In this video we will look at what we know about electronic warfare in the Ukraine war, specifically at the differences between Russia and Ukraine. The Russian experience in Syria, how Ukraine is supported with EW from the West and how to sell EW since it's quite a nebulous, particularly in contrast to tanks. For this I talk with the writer and analyst Thomas Wiffington and if you want to know more check out the links in the description. Like Tom's article in the Defense Horizon Journal. So in terms of electronic warfare during the Ukraine war, what are the major differences that you know about between the Ukrainian and the Russian side? Well, it's very hard to know definitively what either side is doing, because obviously so much of it is, um, is confidential and classified. Um, there's not been a huge amount of information coming out about how the Ukrainians have been using electronic warfare. One of the things that you do hear is that they're very effective at it. They're very good at it. Um, I think that's through a combination of things. I think, firstly, the Ukrainians have been fighting the Russians since 2014. So they've, this is almost 10 years of experience that they've had doing it. Um, so that obviously makes a big difference because you're able to understand increasingly how your enemies behaving and how they're acting. On top of that, Ukraine has developed a, a particularly good defense electronics industry. And that's also critical because they're able to develop the sophisticated systems that they need to support um, their electronic warfare campaign. And I think the third factor is um, assistance, covert and otherwise, that they've been getting from third parties involved in the conflict who've been able to share their expertise um, and also to help them develop tactics, techniques and procedures to attack Russian communications, Russian radar, Russian use of satellites, that kind of thing. So I think that I think they're pretty good at it. We do know, um, ironically, we know comparatively more about what the Russians are doing in the electromagnetic spectrum and how they're using electronic warfare. Um, and one of the lessons that, that's come across is that initially their use of EW was quite disappointing. It was not necessarily as effective as perhaps me and many of my colleagues and comrades who were interested in EW would have thought. Um, one of the things that surprised us was that electronic warfare, particularly for the Russian army, is, is front and centre of their doctrine. So it's, it's incredibly important to them to the extent that they actually have a mantra where the Russians say, if you attrit a third and if you jam a third, then the remaining third will fall. And that's really reflected in how uh, the centrality that they see electronic warfare with. But one of the problems I think they had at the start of the war was that their EW was intermittently effective. So there were times when it, when it did work quite well and there were times when it, when it didn't. It, they didn't really manage to, to seemingly achieve consistency behind it. And the reasons for that are, are many. Um, and I think one of the things that was interesting to observe early in the war was that um, they were not particularly capable of jamming satellite communications. Um, every night we could see satellites uh, news broadcasts from theatre of operations in live in real time. Now, if Russia was good at, if they had the effectiveness to blank out SATCOM at an operational level, which is what they would need to do that, you wouldn't be getting those signals because you'd be, you'd be jamming any SATCOM at all. Um, and the Russians did struggle to do that. What they were able to do was to attack um, the Starlink terminals that Elon Musk sent and also um, terminals that another company called Viasat sent. But how they did that was by cyber attack rather than jamming. So they Im implanted malicious code into those systems. And very rapidly, I think within 24 hours, there was a software patch that was immediately available that nullified that cyber attack. Um, but I think th the, the problems that the Russians have had is that... Um, Firstly, they, they suffer from electronic fratricide. So when they're jamming, they're often jamming their own communications as well. They're not really being as, as judicious as they perhaps should be with, um, OK, we're going to jam these frequencies because we know the enemy is using them, but we've got to leave these ones clear because we're using them. Yeah, what, you, what you have are called tab taboo frequencies in electronic warfare, so ones that you will never, ever touch with jamming. Instead, it was a much more of a sort of sledgehammer approach of, OK, just jam everything. And... And then when that was clear that that wasn't working because 
their own troops are being affected by it. I think they fell back into sort of trying to use EW a bit more judiciously, but that didn't kind of work out, I think, as they would have hoped. And what you saw was they started going from having synchronous operations to sequential. So in terms of how the Russian, Russian army doctrine had work, worked in the past, is you'd have jamming and you'd have artillery being used and you'd have manoeuvre going on at the same time. So your classic sort of air land battle, everything's happening at the same time and you've got all these different effects going on. Well, one of the things that started to get observed later on in the conflict was that um, you'd have electronic warfare used at, right at the start of the manoeuvre. That would then stop. Then the artillery comes in. That would then stop. Then the ground force goes in, you know, with mounted, dismounted troops, does whatever whatever the mission dictates. And that's not really using electronic warfare as effectively as it should be. EW works best when it's, when it's harmonised with other effects. And so the big question is, well, why wasn't it used like that? And I think to sort of summarise, there's, there's probably technical issues with it. So the problem of jamming your own side, affecting your own communications. And I suspect the other problem is also um, a lack of experience in, in doing that at the kind of grand tactical slash operational level. So we saw, if you think about before the war, we saw a lot of these big zap ad exercises that were going on. They were, they were very, very telegenic, you know, with the sort of hind helicopters flying in and tanks and all of this business. Um, but what I wonder about is how much of that was 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 genuine all arms manoeuvre with EW being used at the same time, just as you have. I suspect not much of that was done or certainly wasn't done in the way that would later prove to be effective in Ukraine. I asked a German combat engineer who is currently fighting with the Ukrainian uh, Legion if he has any experience with electronic warfare and he basically responded, yes, he has it. He saw the, basically that radio and also mobile phones didn't work and also that drones basically just dropped out of the sky and I think he specified it or somewhere else that what happened with the drone is that it thought it was like at one kilometer height or something and not at 100 meters height and so it went down really fast and necessarily it crashed into the ground so how would that be performed because for me it's like that looks more like a software hack than than like can you basically simulate that the ground is a different level with 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 jamming or with, with an electronic warfare operation or uh, um, not operation um uh, basically signals or something is this possible so it's, it's interesting, those observations, because one of the things we have heard in terms of the Russian effectiveness is that when the Russians are using electronic warfare against civilianized systems, so you mentioned mobile phones, um, if, if it's being used against standard civilian-style handheld radios, walkie-talkies, if you like, and when it's being used against drones, it has been quite effective. And that's also been observed in Syria as well. So a lot of the Russian electronic warfare equipment has now been deployed to the Ukrainian theater, was put through its paces in Syria. And it was particularly effective against those kind of capabilities, which in the Syrian environment was ideal because you were fighting ISIS and ISIS were primarily relying on civilian standard equipment. And so the EW becomes very effective against that because when you're using your your cell phone, when you're using, you know, like a drone that you can buy from a hobby store, for instance, you're not going to have a military grade in, of encryption on the signal. And what that means is that the signal is very, first of all, it's comparatively easy to discover. And then once you've discovered that signal, you can then manipulate it or you can jam it. You can do all kinds of things in order to... Um, have the desired effect you want if it's perhaps to jam the mobile phones or what you might want to do which the russians are very good at doing is actually taking control of the mobile phone signal and then they have a system um, which is based which uses the uh, one of the drones they have called the all 10 it's the layer 3 system i think is is the one and what that does is that these drones there's usually three of the drones they fly up they go to you know ten thousand feet whatever it is they have a big view of the battlefield and they actually form a cell phone network in the sky. And so they effectively act as your local cell phone tower would do. And what the Russians have done is then use that to either 
take data from the phones, so hack into to the mobile phones and exploit data or use it to send demoralizing text messages. They've used a lot for psychological warfare. Um, there's there's a, a story I'd heard where a Ukrainian unit, this was before the um, invasion last year, after the initial invasion in 2014, the Ukrainian unit was coming under fire, um, a sustained artillery fire, which was very destructive. And at the end of that, the surviving troops got a text message on their phone saying, how did you like the artillery fire? And, and so, you know, the, the Russians have been very effective at that. And I think the, the interesting thing with the drones, I mean, I, I can't say for certain how you, how you could do that. But if you think about a lot of the drones, you're, you know, you can control them from your cell phone, for instance, or you can, you're using a computer based system to control them. So it's just a matter of using a jamming signal to hack into that control system and then alter the parameters of the aircraft, what it what it thinks happening, and and there you go. One of the apparently one of the most simple ways with the drones is, is just simply blocking out the G, the GPS signal. So jamming the GPS signal again. This is with a civilian drone, and what the drone will do is just land. You know, it'll either land or it will return back to where it was launched from because it's suddenly going. Okay, don't understand what's happening here. Um, so I'm going to land, or I'll just go back to where it's launched. And of course, if it flies back to where it's launched from. If you're the bad guy, that's very useful because then you can pinpoint that it's going to go back to where the pilot is and then you can get fires onto where the pilot is. So it is a problem. You know, they, I think to summarise in Ukraine, one of the things is that the, the Russians have, Russian EW has struggled with military-grade systems, military-grade electronics, but with civilian-grade systems, it's shown itself to be quite effective and it continues to be quite effective now. So in, in terms of support for Ukraine, how much... EW equipment was sent or is this also basically might have most of this be sent un under the radar so that it was not really disclosed because artillery and tanks is always mentioned and most people care about this but EW most people don't care but at the same time it's something you probably don't want to tell them at all because that is like more more important for operational security so what do we know what Ukraine received or not re or, or not received? Well, we do we do know um, electronic warfare equipment's going in because you often see, for instance, on the official press releases from the White House and the US and from the State Department, Department of Defense, that that is amongst the things being supplied. I mean, in terms of the actual nuts and bolts of what's in there, I, I simply wouldn't know, you know. Um, but I, I would expect it's been it's been quite comprehensive. And I, I suspect the other thing that's important is is just assistance that's being given as well. So it's, it's know-how, it's, it's um, trying to get the best practice that NATO have um, and, and inculcate it into the Ukrainians' way of doing electronic warfare and vice versa. You know, we're going to have a situation where um, the Ukrainians are now the most experienced combat force in Europe, um, hands down, um, at that type of warfare. Nobody comes close. And one of the things I've often been saying to people is it's almost getting to a stage, and I think this is applicable in electronic warfare, it's probably applicable in other branches of warfare too, where it's almost not so much a case of, well, what can we teach the Ukrainians? It's now, what can they actually teach us? You know, we, if, 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 if I, you know, had a, a Ukrainian electronic warfare major sitting in the room, I'd just be right, okay, I've got my deck chair, I've got my cup of tea, I'm all ears, you know, talk because you, you can learn so much. So the, the, assist, you know, the assistance is there. I, th I think the, the, the crucial thing for the Ukrainians is that um, no assistance will ever be too much assistance. You know? And I think that there's no such thing as too much EW equipment. I think they need everything they can get their hands on. And I think it, it, it's very easy to talk about artillery, to talk about tanks, to talk about metal and hardware, which is crucial. I mean, it's so important. But it, it's also important to talk about the, these EW systems and to get them out there. The challenge that we'll face is that a tank is a very tangible thing. You know, it's a very, the, the public understands what a tank looks like and they understand why it's important. But when you're trying to articulate to policymakers about electronic warfare equipment and capability, it's much harder because it's much more nuanced. It's, it's as we said, at the start of the interview, it's not something that you can see. It's we're fighting in a domain that's invisible, so it's always more of a challenge to sort of um, articulate that. And of course, it's a question of money because if you've got 
several, you say you've got 3 million um, euros to spend, you spend that 3 million euros on perhaps, you know, one artillery piece or a couple of artillery pieces for the Ukrainians, or do you spend it on all that EW equipment? I think there's an understandable temptation on the part of the politicians. You want to spend it on kit. Okay. And, and equally, that's what, you know, the Ukrainians are lobbying very hard for kinetic stuff. But yeah, the, we've got equipment going in, but we need more of it, I think would be how I would summarize. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I know the problem with when I make a video about tanks, I, it's usually guaranteed that it goes well. If I do anything else, <laughs> it's, 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 it's all, always a gamble. And, and I particular, I think one video about cyber, which was one of the, the videos that did worst last year. And that's a shame because it's, it's a, it's a cool, it's a cool, sexy topic. You know, it's really interesting, but crucial, but that that's the problem you you have to market it so and i assume it's 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 and i think to a certain degree it's the same for the politician and even to the military to a certain degree because yeah in the end you see a tank a tank can destroy something and but and you see an ew equipment and and everyone is like question marks all yes. over the place basically <laughs> in their head oh that looks nice is this a radar or or whatever yeah so so like i assume it's it, it's that problem it's it's a, yeah. i guess it's similar to security in in the civilian sector that people always say yeah the the economics guys see security as it's always it only costs but there's no benefits exactly until yeah. an attack happens yeah well it's like having roof insurance isn't it in your house that yeah. you pay you pay all of this money for roof insurance you you hope to goodness you're never ever going to need it but it's x you know it's however much it is a month but the day you do need it. You'll be really, really pleased yeah. that you you purchased the insurance. But I think I think you're right. I think um, uh, you know I was I was joking with my partner once about electronic warfare and the equipment, and and I said, oh, you know, it's amazing that I was looking at some spectrum monitoring equipment, and it's really, really interesting. You can do all of this, and she'd be like, yeah, but you're you're not like other people, you know, <laughs> and <laughs> and, it, and it's quite true because it is it's it's a it's a hard sell if you're saying to people, um, if you're a politician and you're lined up a, you know, in front of a load of signals monitoring equipment, this is what we're sending to Ukraine. And you can imagine your constituencies are going, what? Why is it yeah. these boxes with loads of buttons? Oh, why aren't we sending those rifles? And why? Uh, it, it, it's, it's tough, you know, because it's actually, it's all of it's important. It's not one's more important than it's all important. So it, it's a challenge. But, and there's only ever so much money, so that's that's the other the other challenge. I can understand it because I I can't see it. If I see a tank, I know okay. It you I, I would say there is no gut feeling at all for this. Like it's it's like three levels away from a gut level for for mm. most people. I would say, mm. or even for for people that have a basic understanding of the necessities. So mm. on a theoretical level. I completely see the importance and everything, but it doesn't really translate to into, into an emotion. And if I see a leopard tank, there's immediately an emotion there, I think. And and I assume for that's the same for nearly everyone else, except probably for you, because you you have probably an emotional connection to EW equipment on, yeah. on a level that is completely I do, I, different for us. I do have, yeah, I, I do have a liking if I see, you know, like ping gals of vehicles in camo with lots of, with you know, big camo nets over them and lots of, lots of aerials, uh, antennas rather around the place and all of that. Yeah, it kind of, it kind of floats my boat that, you know, but, but, it, but equally I get it with the, you know, I, I'm, I'm glad you brought up the Leopard because for me it is like the coolest looking tank ever. <laughs> you know, and I, I think anyone anyone should have an emotional response to to seeing a Leopard because they're they're really cool. But I think that the the problem really or the challenge is that you in, in, with something like e, EW, you're spending a lot of time explaining to people the basics of of how it works before you get into the discussion in a way. And it's not a problem doing that at all. I think it's an important part of it. But you, the, you have to sort of articulate firstly, okay, this, this is what it does and this is how it works. And then you can get on to the, um, the sort of nitty gritty, if you like, of, of, of what you want to do or, or why, it's, why EW is important. 
One of the things I've noticed in my career so far is that we are in a, a situation now where EW is crossing over into our everyday lives in, in a way that it, it wasn't before. I was talking to a colleague of mine this morning and we were saying that our memories of the Cold War were, from a land warfare perspective, you had, if you were an EW expert, you would be sitting, if you're in NATO, you'd be sitting in your vehicle on the western side of the inner German border and you would be doing an exercise with your German counterparts, your French counterparts, whatever, and your task would be, right, where are the enemy's radios? What are their networks doing? What's the traffic on the network? And what do we need to do to that network? So do we want to jam it or do we just want to exploit the intelligence that's moving around in it or do we want to do both? The intervening sort of, where are we, 40 years, or at least 30 years since the end of the Cold War, what that's brought is we're now seeing a situation where you're having G GPS being jammed that's affecting merchant ships. You're having Chinese trawlers that are changing their, the identity of their vessel and their position of their vessel when they're illegally fishing in parts of Asia. You're having aircraft that are having their GPS jammed. You are having um, uh, disinformation that is spreading on the World Wide Web or via the internet that is having an impact within countries. All of these things are going on and, and they're all using the electromagnetic spectrum in some way. And so what we're seeing now is, is that this is electronic warfare, if you like, is affecting our daily lives. It's in different forms, but it's still affecting it. And what that's doing is it's triggering a conversation and it's triggering a public conversation. And I think for those of us who are, who, who are working in the EW world, who are fascinated by it, it brings a challenge for us because on the one hand, what we've done has always been very secretive. I mean, EW, you know, EW folks are nicknamed crows and they take the name crows because they were used to be known as ravens. And it was like this idea that they sat behind a black curtain with all of their oscilloscopes. You know, it's like, like a dark art, you know, it's kind of like this sort of alchemy that's going on. And, and now we've got a situation where you've actually got these things being discussed by policymakers. And it, it, it puts us in a strange position because we're very used to secrecy and that's what we do. But now we're actually having to articulate that. To the, to the general public. And I think, I think it's why it's a very interesting time to be involved in electronic warfare, but I think it's a challenge at the same time. And it comes back to the point you made just now about how do you inculcate with people that you need this stuff and the Ukrainians need this stuff and NATO needs this stuff and allied nations need this stuff when you've got all these competing priorities that are going on. And perhaps one way of doing that is linking it back to what's happening in the civilian world and saying, okay, you know, this is what we need to think about because this is what's happening to us too. So I, I guess probably the best example would be then in a in a real life discussion that you jam the phone of of the politician you're having a talk with, probably or something along those lines. Exactly, or or you or or you eavesdrop on it, you know, you just hack into it. What are they talking about? Or you use that signal to um, security services use what they call MC catches, and you, you know the MC is your international mobile. Is it international mobile subscriber identity, I think, which is every phone has one, you know, and there's a way you can actually track somebody with their using their MC number, which is and, and if you want to keep tabs on bad guys, you know, criminals, people involved in organized crime, terrorism, that kind of thing. Then, then that's what you're going to use to do it or one of the mechanisms. So, again, you've got you've got this use of EW in the in the civilian sphere. Um, so it's, it's, it's affecting us all in, in ways we might not necessarily imagine, you know, but it does have an effect. Yeah, so, so in that sense, it's very similar to the hybrid warfare that we basically, that the, the civilian world and the military world seems to be the, the boundaries are completely dissolving, basically. Mm, mm, absolutely, yeah. Um, it, 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 because it's the way, because it's the way we conduct so 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 much of our daily lives is is dependent on this spectrum that, that the military are also using um if you think about it if you just if you just take just give the afternoon i'm having as an example here i am i'm you're you're based in austria i'm based in france so 
we're either using a satellite, you know, our communications are either going across the satellite or they may be going through a cable, it's possible. But during our conversation, I've gone and collected a delivery from downstairs. That DHL driver will have used GPS to find my location. He will have, he will have received information regarding my delivery through a radio message to his phone. At the end of the day, your, your cell phone is just is, is a radio at the end of the day. I've, I'm heading to the countryside this weekend. I've, I've booked railway tickets. I will access them at the station through my phone. Again, I'm using a radio signal to get my, my, my tickets. So all of that is using the spectrum in some way. My, my whole day went for a run, listened to some music. How's the music getting to my phone? Again, it's through a radio signal. I'm, yeah, my timing of my run through GPS. We're using it all. And we're using it for so many different things. And, and that's, as you said about the whole hybrid warfare, that's why you've now got this situation because what the Russians and Chinese have been very good at doing is realizing this reliance and thinking laterally, right, how can we leverage that for our political ends? And it's quite class fits at the end of the day, war is a continuation of politics by the means. So here we are, you know, we're, the, 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 this is very much how those nations are seeing things is that hybrid warfare is it still involves warfare um, but it's affecting the civilian population in, in ways that they maybe don't immediately think about thank you very much for your time thank you thank you for watching and see you next time bye